Well, it is good to have you here this morning on this Labor Day weekend. This week, we're starting a new series um, called Upside Down Kingdom. Um, now, uh, just so that uh, we can get a, a clear thought on this, this is really um, a series about uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And here is what Anna Case Winters writes in her commentary on the Gospel of Matthew. She writes this, she said, The Sermon on the Mount, in its clarion call to a radically different way of life, it unmasked the sinfulness of the life we, live, we now live, not by giving a set of prescriptions to be followed in some legalistic manner, but rather examples of life oriented by the love of God and neighbor. It's funny how that just keeps popping up. Love God, love people, right? So here's what I want to talk about, get us started here. In the early 1970s, so that was probably before a lot of you guys were born. So in the early 1970s, there's a psychologist, his name was David Kipnis, and he wanted to know if power really does corrupt people. So in a series of experiments, Kipnis had subjects assume the role of manager over a group of employees in a fictitious work situation. Think the office, okay? In some cases, in, in, in some cases, Kipnis gave the managers very little power. In other cases, the managers had considerable power. They decided whether employees were fired, transferred, or promoted. The bosses with more power were more likely to be coercive or to use strong tactics such as criticizing employees, making demands, displaying anger. They were more dismissive of an employee's performance and tended to credit themselves for their employee's success. Powerful bosses were also more likely to keep a psychological distance between themselves and their employees. Kiptis concluded this, that having power inflates our self our, our sense of self, and makes us less able to empathize with those lacking power. So there was another study that was done in 2022. Another researcher named Paul Pift. And so he had subjects play a two-person game of Monopoly, in which power was intentionally skewed. One player was given a wad of cash, the use of both dice, while the other player received only half the cash and one die. Within minutes, the subjects with more cash and dice, the high-status players, began acting noticeably different. You guys know what I'm talking about. You've played Monopoly, right? right? They hogged the space at the table. They made less eye contact. They took more liberties, such as moving the low-status players' gain pieces for them. They also made more noise when they moved their own pieces. Everyone knew the game was rigged, and yet within a few minutes, the roles crystallized, and the high-status players started pushing people around and acting like they had real power and real status. The conclusion of both experiments... A little bit of power really does corrupt ordinary people, even when it's just a game. Here's what I want us to take away from today. The upside downness of the kingdom of God is this. From the very beginning, Jesus calls his followers, his disciples, his church, you and I, as Richard Rohr writes, to take the low road to operate from the minority position, from the position of an immoral minority, much more, much more than a moral majority. And in our culture, our setting, our reality, that's called upside down living. Would you pray with me? So God, we are talking about something that's really counterculture, where we we operate on a totally different realm of reality than the world does. And Lord, that's not because we're better than the world. It's not because the world is so hopelessly broken. But rather because, God, you called us to something different, to something unique, something that's otherworldly. God, may we step into that reality and live it every day. 
in a way that uh, exudes love, exudes uh, excitement and enthusiasm, Lord, and authenticity. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. So we're going to begin this extended teaching through the book of Matthew, Matthew's chapter 5, 6, and 7. And what's really critical is that we have to recognize just how surprising, perhaps how shocking it is to hear Jesus speak about and kind of frame life with him as being such an incredible reversal of what we think about as right, as normal, as what's best, as what's good. And it's no mistake that Jesus launches this kind of corrective view of life with him and explains that our lives evidence his presence really in three ways. There are three things that we kind of start with as we jump into the book and this this part of Matthew's gospel. The first thing that uh, Jesus addresses when he starts talking about uh, this upside down kingdom is he talks about our posture here on earth. And let me uh, be really clear here about this. The word that's used here for blessed, the word that we see used for blessed, is translated from a Greek word, meaning uh, it's the word makarie, makarie. And it carries with it the idea of happy and perhaps even rich. But when Jesus spoke Aramaic, which is a language that is no longer alive, uh, the closest word that came to that comes to that word that Jesus used is Hebrew word, which Jesus probably did speak Hebrew, is a word called Baruch. And that word translates as blessed. And as one writer shared, the word blessed as it appears here in Matthew's gospel should carry with it really the sense of responsibility. But we'll talk about that responsibility part later. Let's, let's read this together. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and they began And he began to teach them. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Have have you guys heard this before? Some of you heard it? Okay. Okay. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Jesus is talking about here. What, What he's talking about here is when we intentionally seek to make our connection, our posture with God right, when that happens, it's going to become obvious to people around us that something's different. This is what Craig Keener said this. He says, no one who has humbled himself or herself with God can act uh, in a wanton self-interest with others. That's, you don't do that when you're, when you're trying to get right with God. And we need to pay, make uh, certain to note that in the era in which Jesus is living, these words um, filled many who were prepared to and actively plotting to take up arms against the powers and the authorities that were ruling the Jewish people. So Jesus is saying these things about blessed are the meek, blessed are those who mourn. And there's a bunch of people who are listening to him, and they're ready to pick up bats, sticks, rocks, whatever it takes to fight the authorities that rule their land. And there are rumors, there are these rumors all across Judea for the Jewish people that they were going to take back their country. In our common vernacular, it might sound something like making Judea Jewish again. That's the reality that Jesus is in. And yet, Jesus speaking to those who would be his followers in a manner that was completely upside down, he poured water on those smoldering embers of anger, resentment, frustration, by insisting that the kingdom of God could not be forced on others, but instead, through humility, God's purposes would become manifest amongst humanity. Jesus is calling us to be mindful of our posture here on earth, where we find ourselves located, what we have, what we own, how it impacts our spirits. The vast majority of humanity does not move in uber-wealthy circles. And the fact is, Jesus knew that when he shared these teachings then, And how much more powerfully is that true now? Here's how one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite uh, authors, preachers, and teachers, uh, Tony Campolo, he puts it this way. There's nothing wrong with making a million dollars. He says, I wish you would all make a million dollars. There's nothing wrong with making it, but there's something wrong with keeping it. 
Campolo went on to say this. He says, my Bible tells me in 1 John 3, 17, if anyone has the world's good and sees his brother in need but shuts off his compassion from him, how can God's love reside in him? Something else here that's of particular interest to me is that Jesus clearly states that grieving is part of the human condition. Not that when we come to him, everything's going to be sunshine, rainbow, bubble gums, puppy dogs. Not at all. Life's going to do what it does. But Jesus is making it clear that life doesn't get the last word. It's Jesus taking something that's very painful, turning it upside down. It's telling you and I that the Father in heaven will always and ultimately have the final word. James Bryant Smith wrote a book called the good and beautiful life, and he puts it this way. He says, heaven changes how we grieve. We still feel pain, but we take comfort in knowing that we will see loved ones again. There'll be no more tears. Laughter and joy await us. So let me me be clear about one more thing here. Jesus is claiming not only that the kingdom of God is coming, but he's actually saying, in fact, It's already amongst humanity. It's already here. Again, from the same book, The Good and Beautiful Life, everything Jesus said about the kingdom is true in our lives. And yes, one day it will be the governing power over the entire universe. But for now, it's intended to be the governing power over you and me. When Jesus speaks of the meek, he says the meek will inherit the earth. Actually, he's directly, he's directly quoting Psalm chapter 37, verse 11. Uh, Psalm 37 says this, but the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. And maybe if, if you've ever had a chance to hear anything about the words that they use to write the Old Testament, this uh, was written in Greek in a in a version of the Old Testament that's called the Septuagint. And so, in the Greek, in the Septuagint, this is the same word here that's used to describe Moses. Did you guys know know that? This word for meek is the same word that's used to describe Moses. From uh, the book of Numbers, you may, now, now Moses, maybe this sounds familiar, Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on earth right? I didn't think about this until I started writing this, but um, there's a, an author, her name's Amy Jill Levine, and she wrote a book called The Sermon on the Mount. She said, given that Moses is the traditional author of the book of Numbers, some of you are already getting this. I have always found that the verse is marvelously ironic, as if Moses is saying, look how humble I am, Right? The original word, this meek, carries with it the idea of one that does not retaliate, which again, I'm thinking about Moses. And part of the story with Moses is why he had to flee Egypt when he was a prince of Egypt, because he did what? He killed someone, right? And yet, something happens in Moses' life where he becomes this incredibly humbled man, this man who's now known as someone who doesn't retaliate. When I was a kid, I was that one kid that always managed to end up on the radar of the bully. At school, in the neighborhood, even at church. Yes, there are bullies at church. Bet y'all didn't know that. I had a bullseye on me, and the bullies would find it. No matter what my other friends would say, no matter what my relatives would say, I mean, good grief, I even had a few of my teachers who would tell me, fight back. But I could never bring myself to return a physical assault with a retaliatory physical assault. I just didn't, I just, I just wasn't cut that way. I didn't, I didn't have that spirit in me. And I think that's what this particular blessing or beatitude as it's known, I think that's kind of what it's getting at. Having an attitude of non-retaliation will result 
an inheritance where Jesus will provide, will give to us kind of this, this wealth that's beyond our wildest imagination. So Jesus begins this sermon by explaining how his people will be seen by others around them, right? Their posture here on earth. And then I believe he begins to shift the focus a little bit as we move to the next couple of verses um, when he talks about uh, our posture with heaven. And I want you to read this, read along with me. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And this is what Patricia Harris writes about the, about the Beatitudes. She said this, The Beatitudes turn the world upside down. It's a shocking promise that's full of dramatic reversals. It's comfort for the mourning, inheritance for the meek, satisfaction that comes from hungering and thirsting for righteousness and justice. The Beatitudes, she says this, they are a welcome antidote to the contrived happiness of consumerism, mindless entertainment of our day. They're good news to God's people, the humble of the earth. And Jesus is making it plain that those who live out what he's talking about in these three verses are in fact seen by the Father in heaven. And he says this, he says, God will fill them, God will be merciful to them, God will see them. There's another author that I really like, his name is John Stott, that name might sound familiar to you. And he writes about this righteousness that Jesus references here in Matthew chapter 5, when he says that righteousness in the Bible has at least three different aspects. There's a legal aspect, there's a moral aspect, and there's a social aspect. And the legal aspect is, is this. Righteousness is justification, or you get into a right relationship with God. Okay? So that's the one aspect of righteousness. He says also there's a moral righteousness, and that's the righteousness of character, conduct that pleases God. So we're trying to live a life that pleases God. Then the third thing that John Stott says about righteousness in the Bible is kind of there's this social aspect, social righteousness. And we learn from the law and the prophets. If you read through the Old Testament, the law and the prophets are concerned with seeking humanity's liberation from oppression together with the promotion of civil rights. Justice in the law courts, integrity in business dealings, and honor in home and family affairs. You know what really amazes me? And we're all, we're all kind of suckers for this. We all fall for this. Uh, we fall prey to values that are completely contradictory to what Jesus tells us. Did you know that? For example, the average American... I love these statistics. The average American watches TV for nearly 30 hours a week. I'm guilty. 30 hours a week. That's 65 days of non-stop television watching every year. Can you imagine sitting in front of your... Come on, nobody does that, right? We all do it. We all do it. By the time they graduate from high school, students will have a reviewed... 360,000 commercials. I don't know who does this, but this is amazing. The average 65-year-old, how many of you in here are 65? Don't put your hand up, I was just kidding. The average 65-year-old will have watched 2 million commercials. 2 million. Each of these commercials has been created by smart people who pack their ads with powerful images, catchy music, humor, Memorable slogans. Most of the commercials have a primary theme. Does anybody want to guess what that theme is? This thing, this product will what? Change your life, right? Give you happiness, deep satisfaction. Based on the worldview presented by TV commercials, here's how you could rewrite the Beatitudes. They would look something like this. Blessed are those who fly to luxurious vacation spots on tropical islands where they lie in chaise lounge chairs, the only 
two people on an enormous white beach, for they shall be satisfied. <laughs> or, blessed are those who drink much beer, for they shall be surrounded by carefree football-watching buddies and highly attractive, socially gifted women in the first half of life, and they shall be satisfied. Or, blessed are those who have the latest smartphone, for they shall gaze on the screen swirling with color and shall get all the information they need just when they need it, and they shall be satisfied. Here's one more. Blessed are those who have outstanding kids. <laughs> Verily I say to you, highly blessed are those who have a golden Labrador retriever. Bounding along on that slow motion video day of playing with the kids in the park. For they shall be the envy of real families everywhere. And they shall be satisfied. Right? You know, it's worthy to note that verse 8 here in chapter 5 of Matthew is really built on, it's really built on Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4, where the psalmist writes, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. The psalmist is very clear about who will stand before God, those who will see the face of God, those who stand in the presence of God, those with clean hands, Jesus says, and a pure heart. So Jesus is explaining this upside-down kingdom living. Upside-down living impacts our posture here on earth with other people. We've examined how upside-down living impacts our posture with heaven. And the last thing I want us to look at this morning is how upside-down living will impact our posture with others. Read with me from Matthew's Gospel. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because Great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You know, something I found fascinating the other day, I was uh, preparing this message, was a portion of an interview that I had a chance to hear with Russell Moore. I don't know if you've heard that name, but he's the editor in chief of Christianity Magazine, and he wrote a new book called Losing Our Religion, an altar call for evangelical America. And National Public Radio, Scott Detrow, he was explaining a little bit about Russell Moore's new book. And he said, this book is an attempt at finding a path forward for the religion he loves. And that's what Russell Moore was saying. I, I, I want to find a way forward. And Scott Detrow said this, when we talked this week, Moore told me why he thinks Christianity is in crisis today in America. So I'm just going to read from that interview. This is what Mr. Moore said. Well, it was a result of having multiple pastors tell me essentially the same story about quoting the Sermon on the Mount, parenthetically in their, in their preaching. Turn the other cheek. To have someone come up afterwards and to say to them, Where'd you get those liberal talking points? And what was alarming to me was that in most of those scenarios, when the pastor would say, I'm literally quoting Jesus Christ, the response would not be, I apologize. The, res the response would be, yes, but that doesn't work anymore. That's weak. And when we get to the point where the teachings of Jesus himself are seen as subversive to us, meaning Christians, we're in crisis. Yet, this is the very essence of what it means to live 
in the upside down kingdom. What Jesus calls his church to embody. In relationship to everyone around us, Jesus is calling us to recognize he's moving the goal line. He's changing the boundaries. And it made him unpopular then, and it led to his death. And we're fooling ourselves if we think we should expect any less. This is what Richard Rohr wrote. He said this, Jesus portrays the prevailing institutions of family, religion, power, and resource control by his loyalty, his loyalty to another world vision, which he calls the reign of the kingdom of God. Such loyalty cost him general popularity, the support of the authorities, inner uh, agony, and finally, cost him his life. For a moment, I want to I drill down on this. This, blessed are the peacemakers, for they'll be called the children of God. Do you notice the language that Jesus used here? He singles out peace what? Not peace keepers. He doesn't talk about peacekeepers. Why do you think that is? Why do you think, what is the difference between a peacemaker and a peacekeeper? Because see, when you use force to make the other person acquiesce or give up, that's not being a peacemaker. Peacekeepers ensure that there's a lack of conflict, while peacemakers, they stand in the very midst of the conflict. They're even willing to give their own lives for the cause of peace. And when you live out this blessing in real life, there are indeed very real consequences. Jesus continues to talk about the, the blessings of persecution for being righteous. Uh, this carries with it this idea of kind of going against society, going against the flow. Um, when I was an undergrad, for a couple of years I traveled on behalf of the college um, during the summer months to various Christian camps all across the Midwest. And I recall being, there was a very popular at the time, what was called the simulation game. Has anybody ever heard simulation game? Does that sound familiar? Maybe not. That's okay. And the point of the simulation game was to give campers uh, an opportunity in real time to have a particular experience. The one simulation game that was extremely popular the summer that I was traveling was called Romans and Christians. Romans and Christians. And at the center of the game was the idea that Christians were being chased. They were being hounded, persecuted by the Romans. And, of course, we usually did the game at night. We designed a particular location as the kingdom for the now underground camp Christians and there were others who were assigned to be the Romans, uh, who would search the campgrounds for Christians. And if they found them, they would persecute them or imprison them. I loved being a Roman. That was, that was fun. I love that. But, but I remember we also added a twist to the game. We would also send out what we called false prophets. Uh, they would try to convince campers that there was another way to go in order to be safe from the Romans. In fact, I'm not, as I, as I was thinking about this, I'm not sure if the campers knew that there was, uh, in addition to a safe house, that there were false prophets. I don't remember us telling them there were false prophets in a false kingdom. I just, I just can't remember. But I don't think we did that. The way the game ended would be some sort of camp-wide broadcast indicating the end of time. You know, we'd make it known across the camp. And all the kids who went to the real, authentic kingdom location, the true kingdom of God, were ushered into the eternal kingdom where they got ice cream. <laughs> but the kids who fell prey to the false prophets, well, you can imagine how that went. What I found amazing about the game even as I think back on it now, was just how over the top it was. But it was pretty impactful on the, lives of those, on the lives of those students. How we called them to imagine what it might be like to endure persecution in the name of Jesus. Now, you know, all these years later, was that the best way? 
Is that the best way to do it? Probably not. That said, I do think that being forced to consider the cost of being in this upside-down kingdom, that was something that Jesus wanted to get across very clearly, very early in his own ministry. That's why we read these words here in Matthew chapter 5. Here's the bottom line. Following Jesus, it's hazardous. It is. It's a hazardous deal. But not because we get the opportunity to wear persecution like it's some sort of weird badge of honor. That's not what I'm talking about. But rather because we're, we're to live a life that is set apart for the purpose of drawing others to him, not to us. We choose to stand for justice, for peace. We're people of our word. We speak truth in love and with grace. Folks aren't going to like it because we're indeed being just like Jesus. Jesus did the same thing, everybody. He was not super popular. But when we live like that, our posture with other people, oh yeah, they'll notice and they'll be impacted by it. There was a hungry uh, patron. His name was Alex Bowen. And he waited for 10 minutes to make an order during a recent visit to the Waffle House. Have you guys ever been to Waffle House? Okay, yeah. He got there at 2 a.m., and after waiting for a while, he finally took matters into his own hands. He found the lone employee asleep. And so Alex went behind the kitchen counter and he cooked the food that he needed to make his own sandwich, which was a Texas bacon cheese steak melt. While doing so, he took a series of photos of himself, his self-service episode. It included him paying for the food. He even claimed that he cleaned the grill when he was done. And then representatives from the Waffle House, they, they really applauded his cooking skills, uh, but they cautioned against anybody else doing that in the future, saying patrons should avoid going behind the counter for safety reasons. Now, no word was really given as to why Waffle House was so understaffed or how the lone employee might be penalized for sleeping on the job. But what's clear, however, is that a man or a woman who really wants a double Texas bacon cheese steak melt can be motivated to take action above and beyond a normal call of duty. <laughs> That's amazing. It's amazing. Think, think about it for a second, okay? Alex could have become incredibly irate and he could have torn that place apart. 2 a.m. Nobody else is in that restaurant. Alex could have demanded that corporate make his experience right. <clears throat> right? Alex could have gone viral and sought to ruin the life of that sleeping staff person or even the whole, the whole Waffle House company. But what did he do instead? Here's the last thing I want to share from a book called Christian Counterculture, the message of the Sermon on the Mount. Again, this is from John Stott. He said this, the Sermon on the Mount is a reversal of human values and basic to biblical religion. The ways of the God of Scripture appear topsy-turvy to humanity. For God exalts the humble and abases the proud, calls the first last and the last first, ascribes greatness to the servant, sends the rich away empty-handed, and declares the meek to be his heirs. The culture of the world and the counterculture of Christ. They're at loggerheads with each other. In brief, Stott says this, Jesus congratulates those whom the world most pities and calls the world's rejects. They're the blessed. That's what it means to be part of the upside down kingdom. Let's pray. God, 
this whole idea of reversing our reality. Lord, it is a, it is a serious challenge. And it's so hard because we are just, we are overwhelmed with messages, with, uh, Lord, all sorts of things that fly in the face of what you tell us in your gospel, in your teachings about living in this world. God, may we not be fearful of it. May we not be frustrated by it. But Lord, may we get excited about this possibility of what the reality you're calling us to step into is all about. Because God, when we do it, other people will see it. They will notice it. They'll want to know, Lord, what is it that motivates us to live in stark contrast to others around us. Lord, may we not do it with an attitude of I'm better than or I'm more spiritual than, but rather may we do it with a heart that says we love you, we're excited, Lord, that we get to live this life that you called us to thousands of years ago. You knew what we were up against then. And may we do it in a way that's life-giving, that fills us with joy, and ask other folks to, to join us in this adventure. We pray this all in your son's name. Amen.